Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Cheryl Selman, and welcome to The Love Code. It's great having you join me today. This show is about inspiring you, uplifting you, transforming you, healing you. It's the antidote to all those news <laughs> programs. <laughs> so I'm so glad you are joining me today because I have another inspirational guest and and a message that will truly support you in expanding your consciousness and finding that peace inside yourself. I have a few announcements. There is a voicemail phone number that uh, Progressive Radio Network has provided, and it is a way for you to communicate with me. So if you would like to leave a message about how you like the show, how you are doing, if you have been putting any of the practices that I share with you each each week on The Love Code into action in your life, if you're experiencing results, if you have suggestions for a show or topic, please feel free to leave a message. I will get back to you, and I'm going to give you the number right now. It's 862-800-6805. That's 862-800-6805. So I hope you will take a few minutes and, and leave a message there. I'd love to hear from you. And also, for people who may be listening for the first time, I have one other show I do on Progressive Radio Network called What Women Must Know, and that's every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you go to my website, drcherylselman.com, and opt in there, then I will send you both of my weekly programs directly to your inbox so you don't have to miss any of the shows. You can listen to them when it's convenient. And my Facebook page is What Women Must Know. So if you like me there, I also post all of these shows. And that is a great way for you to be able to listen at your convenience but not miss any of these fantastic conversations. And one last thing I want to say, I am facilitating, I should say co-facilitating, a very special program for women. And it is an eight-week program. I'm doing it in conjunction with the um, uh, Tao Institute And this is an uh, an amazing program for healing, not only understanding how we can heal our hormones, how we can rejuvenate our bodies, working with some of the most leading-edge information research that I have been investigating and using in my life, but also working with our soul. We're going to be working with the power of our spiritual connection, which underlies all of the imbalances and can correct those imbalances. So combining the knowledge about our hormones and rejuvenation and healing chronic illnesses with the spiritual component is going to be an extraordinary experience of real change and life transformation. So if you'd like more information about this online program that begins in April, just go to my website, drcherylselman.com, and I will have more information there and direct you to enroll if you would like to participate. It's uh, going to have just a limited number of women involved in this course so we can give a lot of personal attention. So there you go, wonderful experience. I'm very excited about this new evolution of my work. I hope you'll join me. Now, we're going to talk about another amazing evolution. (laughs) It's We're going to be talking about silence in the age of noise with my very special guest today, Erling Kage. So let me just tell you a little bit about Erling. He's an extraordinary man. He's an explorer, an art collector, publisher, and author. And Erling is the first person to have completed the Three Poles Challenge on foot, the North Pole, the South Pole, and the summit of Mount Everest. He has written six previous books on exploration, philosophy, and art collecting, and runs Kage Forlang, I hope I said that right, a publishing company based in Oslo where he lives. So he's an extraordinary adventurer on inner and outer worlds, and it's my pleasure to welcome Erling Kage to the show today. Hello, Erling. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you for a very nice introduction. 
Well, uh, I'm, I'm so looking forward to it. I, I have to tell my audience, you are calling from Oslo, so it's great to have all these international guests on the show. You're such an interesting person. I, I want to start off by asking you, what was it in, in your life that fueled this fire to be not just an adventurer in life, but really take on extreme challenges. Where did that come from, Erling? Is that, is that you know, kind of your your uh, ancestral roots as a Viking? What's that about? Mm, I um, I think we're all born explorers in the sense that uh, when I look at my own kids, when they were small, they wanted to climb before they could walk. They were wondering what was hidden behind the door in the house. So I think this is very much in our spirit from day one. So in that sense, I don't think you become an explorer. I think you're you're born an explorer. And uh, that spirit never goes away. Of course, it's diminished through the years because parents, friends, uh, kindergarten, school, all have expectations. um, But still, I kept the spirit to a great degree. Um, I'm born in Norway, uh, so I'm used to the cold, I'm used to the snow, I'm used to skis. So I guess that's a reason for me walking to the North Pole, walking to the South Pole alone, and also climbing Everest. If I had been born in uh, in, 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 in the way further south where it's warm, I'd probably do something else. But still, I think I would be an explorer. Well, but you know, it's such an extreme goal to have. You know, it's. I, I agree. We're all explorers in our own way, to a greater or lesser extent. And I, I really hope people uh, ignite that passion to explore their lives and explore possibilities. I mean, I love traveling, and that's a way that I I explore other cultures, other realities. I I ex- do inner explorations of other realities, but. It's fascinating to talk to someone who really took on a, a, an extreme goal, an extreme goal. I mean, not only did you go to the North Pole and the South Pole and to, to Mount Everest, but you did it on foot, and you, I believe, did it alone at times. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I walked um, alone to the South Pole as the first for 50 days and nights in the midnight sun. Uh, did not have any radio contact uh, or no contact with the outside world. I didn't see any human beings. I didn't see any animal life. So it's kind of totally by myself for that time. And that expedition taught me a great lesson about um, silence, about how silence can be a good thing, how it can be a rich thing in life. Uh, because when I grew up, I quite often felt when I was a kid that silence was about being bored, it's about being sad, it's about being lonely. Uh, but, you know, you know, slowly in life I start to learn uh, about the importance of silence. Not, you know, live in silence for the rest of my life, but, you know, every, every now and then because we live in an age of noise. So, but having said that, um, um, you know, Apropos what you you know you just said, Lillian, I think you know it's of course it's hardship. It's really tough going walking to the South Pole or climbing Everest. Um, but today I have three daughters, and for a while I had three teenage daughters. And I have to say, to me, that to raise them and be responsible for them was much much tougher than climbing Mount Everest. <laughs> I'd probably agree with you. <laughs> but you were prepared. That maybe that's why you did all that trekking to the North Pole, South Pole, and Everest to prepare yourself to be a father to three teenage daughters. <laughs> um so so um so you wrote this wonderful book called Silence in the Age of Noise from your trip to um that solo trip to the South Pole. I I, I you know, it's it's not often that I get to talk to someone who's on a solo trip to the South Pole, and I'm sure it's true for my listening audience as well. So 
Can you share with us about that experience? First of all, what made you do it alone? And how did you even get permission to do it alone? And and then if you can share some of the experiences <coughs> you had and, and and how long uh, how long did that trek last? So those are those are some of the questions that come to mind. So can you can you share that that adventure with us a bit? Yeah, it's about um, 820 miles, and um, and I dragged everything I needed for the whole trek with me on the sled. So I had uh, food for 66 days. I had fuel for 70 days in case I was running out of food. I could still heat water or melt ice and snow to get rid of water. And, and so I was dragging about 260 pounds. And... Um, and uh, started on the northern edge of Antarctica. I just walked into this huge, vast, white nothingness. And of course, Antarctica is the coldest place on Earth. It's the windiest. It's the most isolated. And it's also actually the place on Earth which the most hours of uh, sun. So it's a place full of extremes and no middle way. And somehow, when you start walking to the South Pole, you have all this noise in your head. And that's also the case for me um, when I go into nature in general. For the first couple of hours or first minutes or whatever, I have noise in my head because I'm thinking. And when you're thinking, you think about the past or the future, about your frustrations, about your happiness, your pleasures, etc., and worries. But after some time passed by, you calm down. You stop thinking, you start to experience, and you're getting closer and closer to nature. And it's a fantastic experience. And it's, uh, you know, it started off like an expedition walking to the South Pole, but eventually it was an expedition into myself and into, into my own inner silence. So, um, can I ask a couple of questions? Uh, first of all, did you have to get permission to do this? Was this, did you, nope. did you, you know, you can just say, drop me off at the South Pole and pick your <laughs> yeah. position. And that's how, I mean, is that how it happened? Yeah, yeah, I think today you need a permission, but at the time I didn't have any permission, no. Wow. So you just, you just boarded a, plane or whatever and then and took your all your 260 pounds of provisions and you said I mean you, and you just set off and your goal was to yeah. go to the to reach the south pole and then return and come and walk back no well, at that time uh, nobody had walked alone to the south pole itself so my goal was to walk from the uh, ocean ice to the pole and being picked up and uh, so at the time, this was in 92, 93, that was kind of a big challenge in, 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 uh, in, in Antarctica. And of course, then people do more and more difficult things afterwards. But I, I reached my goal and became the first person to walk there by himself. Wow. Um, so so I, I want to talk about that interior experience that you had in a minute, but I, I, I know you had some adventures, and uh, obviously you, you, you took the batteries out of your phone. You, you chose not to have any communication. Well, I, you know, I, maybe it's uh, different for different people, but it brings up fear. It brings up fear. You're, you're kind of thrown into the unknown with extreme challenges being on the South Pole. What is that like for you? How, how did you deal with your fear or, or I assume there was fear that came up I mean you're pretty fearless but I mean, you you did have I believe some close calls there what what, what was that like for you mm, when I'm thinking back on it uh, I don't remember so many you know close calls um, um wasn't there something uh, about getting close to a falling into a crevice or something I read? Yeah, yeah. I felt I was a few times <laughs> exactly. I, I, I uh, uh, once actually uh, went through the snow. I walked over a snow bridge, went through with both legs, and was just hanging on the snow bridge, uh, kicking air with my legs, and 
of course, that's a close call because if the snowbridge had to hold me up, I would you know, fall all the way into the crevasse. And would never be found afterwards. I would be still be down there and not talking to you. Uh, <laughs> but having said, <laughs> but having having said that, not not in the physical, uh, maybe on other levels. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But having said that, it's you know that's one occasion. I have a few of those occasions, but in general, it's it's about putting one leg in front of the other uh, enough times. And then you get to the pole. So it's technical wise, it's quite simple. And um, it's just a matter about, you know, getting up in the morning, find a rhythm, try to enjoy life and, you know, enjoy the silence, the silence surrounding you, uh, the silence within. And um, whenever you have a storm or you have a crevasse that you almost fall into, it's kind of a part of you because you're out in nature for so long, so you don't feel that your body is stuffed by your fingertips or by your skin. It's kind of extended into nature. So that's one reason why things are really frightening back home in Norway, and my mother would be scared of shit out of if she saw me. Uh, doesn't yeah. feel that <laughs> dangerous when it went Well, well. Um I mean, when you're doing that walking and you are in silence, there's a whole shift of consciousness that happens when you can enter into silence. And I'd like you to talk about that. What what did you receive when you enter into silence? And how does that how, how is that an important message for all of us? It is an important message, I think, uh, for all of us that we need silence to get to know ourselves. We need silence to enrich ourselves. And when I talk about silence, I'm thinking about silence as uh, uh, the opposite to uh, to noise. And noise, I'm thinking about uh, you know all the distractions we have throughout the day from all the smartphones or from different devices that we're always connected, always available. It always disturbs. It always some expectations we have, or others have expectations to us. This is what I think about as noise. While silence in itself, it's is rich. It's a quality. It's something exclusive, luxurious, and silence is also key to unlock new ways of thinking. So um, that's why we need silence. And and and. Noise is about departing from ourselves, it's about running away from whom we are, while silence is very much about facing ourselves and, um, and, uh, and get to know ourselves. You know, um, for anyone who really is seeking more inner peace, more healing, more of a connection to who they are in this great universe, and all the great spiritual traditions have talked about the need for silence. So it's so interesting that for so many people now, I mean, even if you even if you live out of cities, you often get, you know, there's, there's still so much noise, airplanes flying ahead. I, I was... Um, at a beautiful landscape in Australia near uh, near the ocean. It was it's beautiful. And what they've done is put all of these wind huge wind generators on the hill. And they create so much noise. It's getting harder and more difficult to find places where you uh, I mean I think silence is a rare thing that people get to experience these days is I guess what I'm saying. I agree. I have been uh, traveling the world searching for silence and I totally agree with you. It's really hard to find. Um, but then I think as also writes in the book that when we live in the world we're living and obviously not everybody can walk to the South Pole as I did. Uh, I think we need to accept reality. It is a lot of noise. Um, uh, around us, and, and, and that's why we somehow have to create our own silence. 
and search for the silence within because we can't wait for the silence to come to us. We have to, we have to find it ourselves. And, and what you will find then is, is um, your own self pole. Hmm. Yeah, it's a great metaphor. Um, when you were walking in silence, um, and I know you're, you're talking about getting so connected to the rhythms of life and to nature, did did you have times of uh, epiphanies, of of spiritual experiences, of connecting to a sense of oneness while you were on this journey? Yes, uh, I had. I'm not thinking about it in you know, a particular, like in a religious way or something. It could be that too, because no. you know, in, in the Bible it says that you know, first they have the storm, then they have the earthquake, then they have so and so, and God wasn't there, but eventually it became calm, quiet, peace, uh, silence, and that's where God appeared. But for me, um, uh, you know, you go there and and. And suddenly you start to find questions to, uh, not to find answers to questions you hadn't asked yourself because you just kind of walk and then you have a break and then some new ideas comes up to problems, you know, you hadn't really been thinking about. And then all this kind of inspiration comes from nature, comes from, comes from the skies and comes from walking, comes from getting tired comes from getting at one with the nature, and that's for sure a spiritual experience. Yeah. So have, how have you taken that experience, which was done a while ago, I mean, the actual walk in the 90s, but how, what has changed for you from these experiences, and what have you incorporated into your busy life back in Oslo now? I still do... Lots of outdoors, uh, but you know, since that time, I got three daughters. I, as I said, I, I have a job, a day job, so I work all day mostly. And my life has been very much about noise, and uh, and that's you know, I think the combination from what I've experienced in the nature, from having a job like most people, and, and raising a family. Um, as many people, you know, taught me also a lesson about, you know, not only silence, but also about noise. Because when I started to look at my daughters, when they were all, te- all teenagers, I got the feeling that they didn't know what silence is. I asked them, you know, uh, about silence, and they just said, uh, silence is nothing. And, you know, nothing comes from nothing. And I had to try to explain to them, silence is something it can be your friend it can be you know uh, a key to understand yourself to get a better life uh, have some more variations in your life and um, you know that's not easy to explain to a teenager so um, that's why I sat down to write a book you know in silence you can talk about it but you have to experience silence to understand Anything, of course, that's true. You have to experience life. You have to experience what it is. I once did a ten-day silent vipassana retreat, and um, that was, you know, meditating. It was in silence. You weren't talking to each other. You weren't even really looking at each other. It was a very inward experience. It was in a very part of a beautiful part of Northern California, so you got to hang out in, in the forest with the amazing trees. It, it was such a, a powerful experience of being able to just observe your thoughts and uh, practice just observing rather than being in the mind. And it does take a while to get those thoughts to calm down. But it's something that was uh, very profound for me and has really stayed with me in this uh, awareness of just observing and and the need for for silence. I I have not done another silent retreat, which I would like to put on my agenda for 2019. But uh, even even so, just um, that one time 
had um, amazing consequences and benefits for me. Well, what are you suggesting to people? So you write about silence. You write about how you did this amazing adventure in silence um, and, and how it was a profound experience. What do you tell people? What What is it that you believe from what you experienced, you can offer people, how how they c- can bring silence into their lives? Mm, I think, you know, to write the book, <clears throat> I first of all want to people to be aware of silence, not to forget silence. And also, you know, to say a few things about how silence can be a good thing because obviously it can also be a negative thing in many people's lives, like one minute of silence and uh, loneliness, etc. But it's, uh, I want to write about how it can be a really positive thing. And, um, you know, I also have experience walking to the South Pole that your brain can actually be wider than the sky. But having said that, of course, in daily life, um, I try to write about how to find silence when you're having a walk, maybe in the forest, but also how you can find silence when it's lots of noise around you. So in the daily life, like this morning, I had a shower. Um, I felt silence, you know, having the water pouring over me. And when I made breakfast for my youngest daughter, I had some inner silence. Um, I can walk to my office, which is 35 minutes, so then I find some inner silence. But of course, when you walk, if you hold your phone in your hand and it's on, then you will have noise, or even if it's, you know, the phone is quiet. So you need to leave the electronics a little bit far away or turn it off to find this silence. And then I have silence when I do the dishes after dinner, and I have silence when I go to bed in the evening, maybe for a few minutes, maybe, maybe for longer, because... This silence I'm writing about is inside you and inside me at every moment. It's just waiting for you to to listen to it. And this is why I believe meditation is really important it, as a way to begin to um, focus within and withdraw from extra- distractions. Certainly when you have your eyes open, Initially, especially if you're learning, when you have your eyes open, you get you, you really do get distracted. It's so easy to just you know be aware of movement, sound, but closing the eyes and going within, following the breath, which is the simplest and most profound way to begin to enter into the silence, is is um, is a practice that I encourage everyone to do. I have all my patients and clients, I just believe that it's fundamental, that we cannot really achieve the full creative expression, the health, the vitality, the joy, uh, opening our hearts, finding a greater connection to life if we are not willing to take some time every day and just find those moments of silence within us. Um, What, you know, is that what you are recommending for people as well? Maybe learn some sort of meditation uh, where they can enter the silence. Yes, um, I'm a big believer in meditation and also, you know, mindfulness and yoga. I think all that is, you know, really great things to do. Uh, but for me, so I still, you know, I still do some meditation and. and uh, and I do self-hypnosis. I try to hypnotize myself for 20 minutes every day. But so many books that have been written about, you know, how to experience silence through those techniques. And when I sat down to write, I want to write about, you know, silence, that you don't need any particular circumstances. You don't need any techniques. You just need to calm down and, 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 and uh, listen to yourself. Um, yeah. uh, I mean, I really want to make this point, so I'm going to ask ask this um, again for you, because I really want people who are listening to understand something really profound. 
And that, I mean, it's the message you have in your book, Silence in the Age of Noise. And I, I think it's worth emphasizing. Why, Erling, is it necessary? Is it imperative? Why is, is it imperative that all of us at this moment of time in the 21st century with our um, distractions with our noise all around us. I mean, you know, 24-7 you can have your radio going, your TV going, you can you listen, you know, to anything you want, streaming on your phones, your computers. I mean, it, our 21st century world makes noise uh, the, 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 the most common experience that is going on all the time. It's prevalent. So silence is a rare thing unless you choose to invoke it, to create it. Um, With everything you have done, what is it that you believe silence is offering us? Why is it something that is a necessary experience for our well-being and even our survival at this point in time? Um, I think, you know, it's so much noise in, in the world today, and, and living in noise, uh, my experience, also for myself, but also from other people, that then life seems to move really fast. I think, you know, more and more people complain to me that, you know, life is so short, uh, life, you know, passes so fast. And all these days and all these months and years that I didn't really know that was my life. And I think that has to do with the way we're living. Because to live in noise is very one-dimensional. You live through other people, you live through your devices, and you're losing touch with yourself, and you're losing touch with nature. So I think one of the reasons why people are more depressed today uh, more sad, more uh, lonely, more uh, you know unhappy today uh, than I have been before. It's because we're losing, you know, we're losing touch with nature and we're losing touch with ourselves. While silence, to me, you know, then you have variations in your life. You see life from a different side. It's not about living more egocentric life, but silence is very much about opening up, seeing other people from a you know different perspective and love life love life even more. And then you will see that life is long. If we listen to ourselves often enough and look up from our devices. Yes, it's really <laughs> um it's really a treasure to have silence and to create silence because it it opens up worlds you know the we were talking about reconnecting with nature you you've mentioned that several times in our conversation and the um the experiences that i have had i've had experiences with shaman in central america south america uh and and, Good and for other you. experiences yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's. I mean, I. Uh, it's profound. And what these teachers have said, what the shaman have said, and what they are wanting to bring back into this Western world of ours, and I think why there's so much interest in the the wisdom from places such as uh, uh, Peru, the Andes, the Amazon, uh, uh, other traditional cultures, and and. And particularly for me right now, exploring Central South America cultures, is is because they understand that we have disconnected ourselves from ourselves by disconnecting from nature. And when you disconnect from nature, you are you're lost, and you can uh, you, you know you're out of your heart, you're in your head. And as a result, there's a lot of pain that is experienced when you disconnect from yourself. And the gifts from the, the, the shaman and the medicine, the plant medicines, are here to help us reconnect because they feel it is imperative, imperative at this moment in time to bring about a transformation of consciousness on this planet it's fundamental to connect with nature because we are 
part of nature, but we have we have lost the awareness of that connection. And uh, I think it's a really powerful message, which it seems to me is what your message is, what your experience was, and what you're really wanting people to understand through your book, Silence in the Age of Noise, and from you know what you've been sharing with us today. Yeah, I I I, I um, absolutely agree, and I think you know it's strange to think about that Mother Earth is 4.5 billion years old, and we have stopped listening to her. It's you know we listen to man-made uh, technology. I mean, trust all this technology, we trust everything which is you know made of, of made from machines. And I think that's very naive. And uh, I'm not anti-technology because we, you know, we're born to be together and communicate and socialize. But it has gone too far. And uh, so I agree with what you said. And I think we should learn from Steve Jobs, the man who gave us the smartphone and you know made it possible for us to have you know stay connected all the time. And you know he strongly warned against what we seeing today like you know with his family so he didn't let his kids play with the iPhone or iPad for more than a few hours every week because you know he understood this has some good sides but it also has some big downsides yeah well that message got lost along the way didn't it yeah exactly <laughs> well, <laughs> you know I mean you know I've I'm not anti anti capitalist either, but you know for sure, you know, uh, I think you know they forgot uh, Job's message, uh, you know, because you know it doesn't make business sense. Yeah, you know, um, I have been um, uh, learning a lot from uh, a man who I've interviewed on my other show, Dr. Jack Cruz, and uh, one is a he's a he's a neurosurgeon. What I've learned from him and what has transformed his life and helped him lose uh, over 100 pounds and get healthy. And now he is embarking on um, sharing what he learned with other people to get healthy. And he uh, uh, challenges a lot of the, the beliefs that we hold. And I, I always like people who are a bit of iconoclast plastic and, and heretics in their own way. But w- what he's saying is um, the most important thing we can do for getting our body back in balance, for really aligning again with our true self, is to get up every morning and watch the sunrise, and watch the sunrise, yeah, which 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 <laughs> we uh, right because who watches the sunrise anymore? And and he says that, and he has all this science to back it up. Um, that when we watch the sunrise, there are certain frequencies that are emitted at that time of the day that activate through our eyes and through our skin all of the major uh, circadian rhythms throughout the body. And it activates our entire endocrine system, starting with the, you know, the hypothalamus, the key center that controls all the systems of the body. Everything gets turned on uh, throughout the entire body when we are exposed to the frequencies at sunrise. And I have been getting up every morning for months now since I've been introduced to Jack's work. I'm very fortunate. I have a balcony and I can watch the sunrise from my balcony. It doesn't matter what the weather is. Even if it's uh, cloudy, of course, the sun's still rising. (laughs) We still get those frequencies. But to totally, tra- I mean, it totally transforms your life. It affects your mood. It affects your health. It allows your body to heal. It's so profound. And who, who knew? You know, and, I mean, it's it's like a blinding flash of the obvious when Jack starts talking about it. But until he did, and until uh, unless you're part of an you know a, a indigenous culture that has more of this knowledge, we have. We we're indoor creatures now. We don't get out very much, and especially to watch the sunrise. I think uh, this makes so much sense. And I think you know, to me, to watch you know the sunrise, 
It's about gratitude. You know, you feel this gratitude too. You see the sun rise in the morning and your life and, uh, and, and, and the day is starting. So it's a fantastic feeling. And, 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 all, and, you know, people have been doing it for thousands of years, you know, because of spiritual reasons and, 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 and for personal reasons, uh, to see the sun rise. It's, it's beautiful. And, you know, sometimes the best things in life are for free. And to see the sun rise is uh, for sure for free. Yeah, you know, it's um it's um something we don't pay much attention to, but as as I am learning what um Jack Cruz has discovered and and how it switches on all these key functions in the body and when we are not exposed to the right frequencies, the uh, ultraviolet and the infrared, and, and we get too much of the what we call the blue light frequencies because that's what our computers are, that's what our devices are, that's what our television is, which is uh, the frequency midday, which we're exposed to at 9 o'clock at night. It has huge implications in our emotional, physical, and spiritual well-being. And um, you know, ways that we can reconnect again, we reconnect, as you were saying, with nature, which you have to stop, you have to be present, and and put yourself outside more, put yourself, um, you know, in, you know, a, a walk, you know, what, whatever, um, or at least park far away in the parking lot. <laughs> So you have to walk a bit to get to your to your you know your destination. Is uh, you know they're simple things, but they're very profound, very profound. And and I, I you know I love what you're saying about silence because I obviously believe that uh, part of our healing or a great piece, a, a great component of our healing, comes when we can be silent within ourselves. The body does heal when we can access silence. What do you say to people, Erling, who say, no, no, and I've heard this all the time, I, I try, I try, I, I can't meditate, my mind is going, uh, it doesn't work for me. What would you say to those people? Oh, Cheryl, uh, um, I think, you know, I travel the world also to urban areas, and my experience is that most people are underestimating themselves and the possibilities they have in life. Of course, if you are overestimating, but most are not. And also, I think that comes to what you asked me, like, you know, I don't need this, I don't have time for it, I'm not, you know, good at it, I'm blah, 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 blah. But, you know, I don't believe any of it, uh, because what we're talking about today is so simple, and it's so easy to achieve. Um, it's an advice, you know, to search for your own silence, not for days and months and years, but you know, every now and then, it's an advice that has survived for thousands of years. So I think any advice that lasts for more than 1,000 years, you should take really seriously. And I was just thinking, as you're saying that, so many of the great artists, the great scientists um, uh, of all cultures have found their inspiration in silence. I mean, those those great ideas came to them in their dreams or while walking quietly in the woods or, you know, when they had some silence. We can actually access solutions to the problems, get insight into our lives, make our lives work so much better when we establish a connection, which has to come from silence. Yeah, for sure. And... Uh, and I think, you know, I think in one way uh, what we're talking about today is something that most people actually know. Um, so when I wrote my book, I was not to kind of tell people a lot of things they didn't know from before, but I want to just, you know, tell an old story with new examples and different angles and, you know, try to influence people to have the willpower to search for this silence because I think, you know, it doesn't make sense the way we are living today that we are not kind of living through over phones, living through over devices and, and forgetting ourselves. It's, it's 
it's, you know, it's counterintuitive. So I think you just need to be reminded about these huge possibilities in life that we all have. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, so Erling, I'm wondering, what's your next adventure in addition to raising three teenage daughters? <laughs> As I said, that's the toughest one. That's the fourth pole. No, it's uh, <laughs> yeah. the fourth pole. Uh, I like that. I I I I'm writing a book on walking, walking one step at a time. And you know, to me, walking is also about silence. But you know, the silence we have talked about today is a bit abstract, while uh, walking is very concrete. So it's kind of the same book, but from a different angle. So I, I love walking, and. Uh, I think to walk is, you know, uh, some of the best things you can do. It's good for it's good for creat- creativity. It's good for your mind. It's good for your health. And as Hippocrates wrote two thousand years ago, it's also the best medicine. Yeah, you know, when when I want to uh, get more creative ideas, um, I I always walk because it. Yeah. The, when I walk, the, as you said, initially the mind is going, but after a while you calm down and and you get inspiration, you get ideas. So I, I, I understand that, getting out and walking, which is also a novel idea these days <laughs> for so many people. Yeah. But but you've, you've also done something really interesting that I just want to mention the, before we kind of come to the end of our conversation. Uh, another adventure you did about walking through... Um, New York City, the Bronx, um, underground through the sewage, city sewage, train, water, and subway tunnels. <laughs> I mean, is, was that your last adventure, a real adventure, or is there? <laughs> I mean, that sounds you know, like an extraordinary do, thing to do. Yeah, I do. You know, small stuff all the time. But you know, this expedition I did with uh, Steve Duncan from uh, Philadelphia. To walk uh, through New York City, uh, through the different tunnel systems. Uh, um, we just went into the sewage in Northern Bronx. I went through the sewage, walked through the sewage down to Harlem. I crisscrossed the city for five days and nights. Uh, it was a fantastic ex- experience. We saw, you know, the city from the inside out and what it would look like if we turned it upside down. So, you know, I wouldn't recommend. Ever, anyone else to the, crawl through the sewer systems and, uh, and run through the subway tunnels, but it was for sure very interesting. I mean, what are sewage tunnels like? I just have to ask: are they are they big enough for you to wa- stand up straight in? And and do you did you walk through sewage? Did, I mean, what what exactly did you do? Yeah, yeah, it's it's quite a few of the sewage tunnels are wide, like. Uh, you can walk, you know, just walk like you walk at home uh, or walk on the street. Uh, while, like in Soho, in uh, New York, you had this, uh, like on the green street, you had this uh, sewage tunnel, which was probably about uh, 40, no, uh, sorry, um, 25 inches or 20, 20 in- inches high. And then you need actually to crawl through it, and of course it's you know it's uh, it's uh, it is sewage, so it's uh, it's <laughs> it's a bit crazy. Um, uh, but you know we got above ground every day, quite a few times to change tunnels. But you know it was uh, it was an adventure, and uh, and and, and uh, I'm not going to do it one more time. But I have to say uh, it was great. Uh, we didn't find any silence in New York because I think New York is very much about earning money, and to earn money makes lots of noise. But you know, we still found yeah. some inner silence and some inner peace. Wow! So you 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 went through all the sewage. T- I mean, do you have like special gear on? I mean, when you're going through a sewage tunnel that's 20 inches wide, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean yeah. that's. Yeah. Do you really want to know? (laughs) I mean, it's. it's, I mean, what was that? I'm sorry, (laughs) I missed that. We had so we had some waders on in the sewage, but of course, when we were laying down flat and crawling, you get um, you get soaked in shit. That's for sure. Oh my god! And then you had to. So then you, you you then you had to come up. Above ground, 
um, and wash off and all of that. Uh, yeah, they don't have, they don't have, they don't have showers underground, do they? Uh, they don't have it underground and they don't have it in the streets either on New York. And uh, so now we just kept on going. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, Sounds more crazy than it was actually. It's um, you know we had we had we, quite a few people joined us every now and then. But this Steve Duncan, this urban explorer, and me, you know, we had a great trip. We sleeping during the day. It I didn't know him that well from before. Great friendship, and and you know, it's interesting that you know people actually living under the streets of New York and you know get to know. Uh, you know, I'd see some of those people. You know, it's it's it has its own kind of you know uh, karma. Wow, absolutely. Are, are there actually people living underground in New York City? Yes, I think you know, in many many cities, you will find people living underground. Uh, in New York, in the nineties, it used to be a lot, and like in Manhattan, in the West Side Tunnel, it used to be small communities. Uh, it's a great movie made called Dark Dark Days about it. Today it's much much less, but they still have some hardcore people living there. Yes. Yeah, how interesting. So you you got to encounter them and and meet them and learn a little bit about their lives. Yeah, which of course are brutal, and that's a good, that's a you know good reminder. Yeah, so, you know, all of a sudden they're they're there, and here they are. These adventures are. Trekking through. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, <laughs> you never know who's going to show up, do you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Before you have peace. <laughs> well, yeah. So interesting. You live such an interesting life, Erling, and uh, I'm sure you know it will continue to uh, be an interesting life as you explore your your reality, your world around you, and share it with us. Um, you know, I, I appreciate your time today and appreciate your words of wisdom and all that you've been doing. Look forward to your next book on, on walking. I just have to ask you one more question before we kind of complete our conversation today. W- what do your daughters think about you? Or is this like <laughs> normal? This is what dads do, or or they they kind of you know scratch their heads. I uh, I think you know, I think they you know. We don't talk too much about expeditions at home, but I feel I have a close relationship with my daughters very much. My uh, two oldest daughters, who are now 19 and 22, like you know, they start to appreciate silence. They start to see it has a value. They're still very connected to their phones, but you know, the, the life's kind of changing and becoming a little bit richer. I don't think they should throw away their phones, but you know. She lies from a different, slightly different perspective. While my youngest daughter, who's now 16, uh, she has a hard time believing my ideas about silence and the importance of inner silence. She's still, you know, she's still a 16-year-old kid, and I think maybe 16-year-old girls are the most unhappy persons on earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure they. Well, I, I think. I, I think she has, you know, a good life also, but it's in many ways. But I think, you know, life is difficult when you're 16, and then silence is very much about, you know, sad things. Yeah. And I think um, they're very blessed to have you as a dad because they will come to appreciate the wisdom that you have. And the most important thing is is that uh, close relationship with your daughter. So that's a blessing right there to be able to just yeah. um, be who you are and share and know you're always there for each other. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I just want people to um, check out what um, Erling has written, his wonderful book, Silence in the Age of Noise. It's really it's a beautiful book. It's a it's it's it's, it's um, inspirational writing. It has some wonderful messages. Um, it's it has a flow to it. It's a beautiful book, Erling, and um, congratulations on that book. And if people want to know more about Erling's work, the uh, best thing is to go to his Facebook page, which is Erling, and I'm going to spell his name, E-R-L-I-N-G, and his surname, Kage, is K-A-G-G-E. So Erling Kage, 
and uh, learn more about what this adventure is up to next. And uh, Erling, I, I want to thank you again for being with us. Um, uh, it's evening time in Oslo, so so <laughs> thank you for taking this time to be with us. It's been, been a pleasure and and uh, quite an opportunity for all of us to reflect and think more about the importance of silence in our lives. Thank you. Thank you for inviting. It's been my pleasure. And to all of you listening, thank you. And uh, do take some moments of silence in your life this week. See what happens when you do that. And until next week, I wish you peace, love, and harmony. Bye for now. Join heart and soul.